our conversation with regards to the new petrol price uh, of uh, Premium Motor Spirit. Um, we're joined this morning by uh, Mr. Israel Aye, as a senior partner, Primera Africa Legal, and also a director at Aspen Energy. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Let's quickly start with your thoughts on the new price of uh, PMS across the country. Um, what do you think may have led to it? Well, okay, um, you know, the, the economics and the politics of price, uh, PMS pricing, uh, has on, 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 at, at its wake a lot of rhetorics. But again, we forget many times um, that what we're really dealing with is a commodity, is a product, more like a product, okay, that is bought at a price and sold at a price. Yeah. So how do we arrive at the pump price of petroleum products? Essentially, it has the cost of the, of the product itself, the charges at the port. It has uh, uh, an element that has to do with um, uh, what you call a bridging cost uh, to various parts of the country and, of course, a margin. Now, what we have is the sum of that is what gives you the pump price. Now, what, what was the, 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 the subsidy regime? The subsidy regime was, uh, came about when government by executive fiat fixes a price yeah. irrespective of the cost of delivering that product to the pump price and pays what is referred to as under recoveries. Last year, the Nigerian government spent a trillion point one naira funding that system to ensure that uh, pump, I mean, uh, PMS is delivered at the pump at a certain price. Because if you require people to import, remember that we are in this position because we simply are not producing enough uh, PMS within the system, okay? And th that is, you, you can have a separate conversation about that. But I needed of us to establish yep. that sort of baseline of fundamentals in order to understand this. So in a sense, what is currently happening post the regulation, uh, the, the pump price regulation, is that government or NNPC uh, through the PPRA is not really fixing prices. They're actually prescribing caps. What they're fixing is the cap because the prices will have to be the sum of what it takes to deliver it to the pump price. Yeah. What they're doing in their wisdom, and that's probably the problem right here, is that they're prescribing caps, a cap to that price. But that is the fundamental of what we're talking about. Yeah, let, let's go a little further with that. Um, the PPPRA is, of course, a government agency. Um, a lot of Nigerians, well, through the NNPC, a lot of Nigerians have all, always believed or, you know, I've heard that, oh, the government um, has no hands in, you know, deciding what the price would be. Let's, can we be entirely clear? Is the government in any way um, a part of what creates those caps and those prices and those figures? Well, that's an excellent question, and uh, there are probably many ways to look at it. In terms of what it costs to buy the fuel and to sell it to the other price, my argument would probably be that the government doesn't have a way, I mean, any hand in it. In terms of what actions we could have taken to ensure that there is adequate supply yeah. of the product, okay, then this government and every other government before it could have done more to increase the refining capacity to ensure that there is enough fuel at the right uh, rate. But again, it's chicken and egg. It's a catch-22 situation. The reason perhaps we have not been able to do this when we had every opportunity up to this particular point to do it is because somehow we had made fixing petroleum prices a national priority. And until you unfix it and allow the market forces to drive it, you probably wouldn't be able to, 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 to drive the prices down. We forget what happened with telecoms. I mean, time was when government wanted to control yeah. the price at which telephony services was available. And, you know, people forget that when the telephony space was opened up, I mean, people bought SIMs for as high as, as uh, 30,000 naira, 40,000 naira. I remember people doing it for as, as high as 50,000 naira. Today, you get those SIMs for free. Yeah. Okay, so for people who have as much uh, crude in the ground as we do, there is the potential for us to be able to access petroleum products at significantly cheaper rates. But investments would need to be made 
to increase the refining capacity in order for us to get it. That's a journey that will take anywhere between two to three to four years. I mean, we understand already that the Rangote uh, refining, refinery is, is, um, is, is ongoing. When that comes on stream, when it does, perhaps within the next year or two, it's going to change the supply dynamics. I read okay. somewhere recently that Boa is uh, looking to do something uh, in that space. But the point really is today, when we, uh, the bulk of the petroleum products we, we, we consume is imported, the cost of getting it to the market at a fixed price yeah. is anywhere between 750 billion naira to a trillion naira. That's a lot. That's a lot. You, you also spoke about the subsidy regime um, for, for Nigerians who are a little worried about the possibility of the price continuing to you know, rise. Um, is there any things that we should be looking forward to or excited about with regards to the removal of subsidy? Well, I mean, um, when it comes to the economics of the removal of subsidy, the truth is that, I mean, I say to people, for example, that over many years, over the last 50 to 60 years, we haven't really developed a petroleum industry. What we really have, if, you're to, if you look at it critically, is an extractive industry. That is the production of oil and gas, uh, according to the principle of win, work, and carry away. Yeah. You know, when we talk about that, so what we really do is we sell crude, we buy petroleum products, and buy every other thing we want. That's just the sum uh, story of, 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 of that particular industry. However, what we need in order to develop a petroleum industry is domestic utilization, indigenous participation. We need to expand refining capacity, processing, and the likes of it, unless you deregulate and that's a dirty word people don't want to hear, then you probably wouldn't get to that destination. But what are the potential benefits of that particular destination? You create more wealth, you create more jobs, you actually employ more people. The reality is that what is known as the petroleum industry in Nigeria employs far too few people for the potential that it possesses and adds too little to the GDP, far too little, not even up to 11% to the GDP. So we need to leverage this resource to create a bourgeoisie economy and use the resource and the revenues to diversify away from oil and to transition Nigeria into an infrastructure economy. You know, and, and so, so those are potentially the issues uh, that we can be looking at. But I mean, I admit that the population, I'm Nigerian, and you know, in terms of the immediate impact, I understand everything that has been said, it affects me as well, okay? But, I think that there are dimensions to this conversation we should be bringing to the table. Yeah. Okay, and one of them, for example, is to say, look, can we as a people today afford to spend one trillion naira to support a subsidy regime? And can we in all honesty say that the benefit of that subsidy regime is reaching the masses of Nigerians? Has it eliminated poverty? Has it even made our lives easier? That's a question. You know, and should we then throw our hands up and say, well, uh, what else should we do? And I said, no. It is an opportunity for every Nigerian to, de to demand transparency in governance and responsible governance. And that's probably where this conversation should be pivoted into. Okay, you can also quickly speak on timing. I'm going to go into um, other, you know, issues uh, with the time that we have. Uh, the timing of the deregulation, you know, what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, the timing, in my, in my opinion, was, uh, uh, you see, when, 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 and it's an interesting point to make about timing. I thank you very much yeah. about that. Uh, so some of us have advocated for this policy pivot over many years. Yeah. Okay. So if you ask me about the timing, I would have said, look, if we beat the bullet five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, Could we'll have been be reaping the benefits yeah. today. Because we, uh, listen to me, a trillion naira, these are numbers, okay? That's money that could, could have been spent building hospitals to respond properly to the COVID. That's money that would, could have been spent on infrastructure. That's money that could have been spent on, you know, providing seed capital for people to be able to grow their business. That's money that could be put to alternative uses to grow the economy that didn't happen at that time. Now, my attitude is, us all should hold this government and every government accountable for how these resources are applied and how these monies are spent. 
you know, yeah. so that it would not just be money saved and then frittered on something else. That's probably where the battle or the war is. But in terms of where we are, uh, that's, that's probably the first point I'll, I'll make about timing. The second point I'll make about timing is that somehow, um, at the time, the, the removal of the subsidy, because the deregulation, by the way, hasn't taken place. I need to say that. What has happened is government has, uh, by policy and regulation, yeah. removed petroleum subsidy or uh, funding for the subsidy okay, regime, yeah. effectively, which uh, size we've heard the minister say. And by the way, those numbers are there. They've not been controverted by anybody. So that's what has happened. At the time the government did that, I mean, crude prices were down. As a result, petroleum products prices were down. And we're going through, because of the lockdown and everything, there's probably not going to be a better time to do that because... You know, it's unlikely that you're going to get uh, price. I mean, I mean, you are going to get uh, crude prices at a hundred dollars, which would potentially shoot petroleum products yeah. up. You know, sort of through the roof. Okay, so um, again, as a people, we can ask ourselves the question: Is there a window of opportunity for us to make this all-important policy pivot? Stuff. <laughs> and of course, it has also created a lot of criticism from uh, the PDP and the Labour parties and, you know, um, all of them, you know, threatening uh, strikes here and there. How do you think the Nigerian government can exonerate itself from all of this development? Is there ways that they can make it easier for the people to understand why it must be done um, beyond the criticism from uh, the Labour unions and the opposition parties? Excellent question. And in this regard, honestly, it feels to me like government scored an own goal. Took, basically just took an own, I mean, scored an own goal. The public engagement with respect to what it has done, why it has done it, needs to have been there. Okay, and, and so that's, that's an excellent point you made. And it really should happen now. And perhaps, you know, quid pro quo, they should submit to greater transparency. And that's really the question. I mean, I remember when Saudi Aramco uh, uh, floated uh, a, a bit of their shares to the international market. Just about 5% of its, uh, of its uh, shares uh, on the international uh, stock uh, market. Yeah. They came out with a very clear uh, and a very transparent uh, model of how they were going to spend the revenues. They said, look, this is how much we intend to, I mean, we, we hope to, to earn. This is how we're going to spend the, we're going to spend the money. You know, we're going to build this many, this, and all of that. And I would say that the more complete conversation is that, okay? is look, if you say you're no longer spending this amount of money funding on the recoveries and the rest, yeah. tell us how you're spending it. You know, that's a dimension to the conversation. Rather than say, you know what, deliver fuel to us at the pump. And at the end of the day, those with two cars, three cars, eight cars, and God knows any number of cars are the ones who are really... Uh, enjoying it. And it is also possible to, to, to think of short-term short reliefs and palliatives yeah. for those who are going to be most affected. So if, for example, it is, it, it, it is probably going to serve a segment of Nigerians more to do mass transportation, uh, mass transportation, uh, bus passes, than uh, lower uh, pump price. Of, uh, of PMS, just one product. So, so, so would, you, would you then say that there might be a trust issue between the people, the masses, and the government? Because we recall, you know, some time ago, the uh, past administration also promised that it would remove subsidy. The government made commitments to diverting some of all that, you know, extra uh, income to infrastructure, healthcare, and the likes. Um, but you know, there's no way to verify that any of these things happened. So would you say that the Nigerian people don't believe that these funds, you know, will truly be, you know, pushed into some of these other areas? Well, I mean, um, so there is a trust deficit and it's historical. You know, it's interesting that we're talking about trust deficits, is deficit even with this particular um, government, because then everybody thought it was some past government and some past government and all yeah. of that. So it is perhaps the story of our lives, right? That there is a trust deficit between the people and those who govern them. Now, how do we, um, and of course, which is exacerbated by the politics, you know, those who are probably 
uh, in the position at the time, maybe, I, I mean, and I'm not a politician, I don't intend to get into the political fray, but you know, but I know that this trust deficit is often exacerbated by the politics of it. How do we dispel the trust deficit? Um, transparency, accountability will probably be the way to go. And the citizen needs to be vigilant. You know, I, the, the citizen needs to be vigilant. The system where we, you know, the, what I refer to perhaps as the messianic complex, where we think that just by putting somebody in the seat to govern, that they will know what to do and, you know, and do what they're supposed to do, is it, it, not enough. Okay, so the, all of us should participate in holding, you know, whoever is in the saddle yeah. responsible for delivering. You know, and that's what civil societies are there for. That's what, uh, what I mean, the, the media organizations, the fourth realm of the estate, that's what we're there for, to be able to follow through with the story. I mean, if you say that this is how much we're recovering, this is what we're building, we should be able to follow through. All of us are participants in uh, the journey to good governance. Okay, uh, and, and that's how we're going to be able to deal with it. Quite frankly, I don't want anybody to trust the government to the point of not monitoring the government. Yeah, but I, I also want to know what your thoughts are on where we, what would you say to Nigerians at a time like this? First of all, we're dealing with a pandemic, um, economic wars across the country, uh, of course, across the world. Uh, but Nigerians, of course, you know, were you know, pretty hard hit you know, by the COVID-19 pandemic. What would you say to Nigerians at a time like this? They need to buy petrol at you know 160, some places even higher than 160. Um, they're a little unsure about whether you know it might go higher, it might be 170, might be 180. Um, how can you assure Nigerians that this is for the best? That's that's a tough question. I probably should be putting that to the Honourable Minister of State, or perhaps the President, Mr. President who himself is the <laughs> president, who is the minister, to answer that. But what I'd probably say in response is to say this: that in the absence of refining capacity to be able to, I mean, in, in the absence of intervention in the supply area, yeah. what we have is what it costs reasonably to get the product to the pump price. The alternatives are very simple. We're either for, uh, bringing out up to a trillion Naira to support a subsidy regime, or slide into undersupply and long queues and the likes of it. Those are the alternatives we're faced with. Let us have an open and honest conversation around that. You know, it's easy to put out rhetorics. It's easy to fan public uh, emotions and sentiments. But let's put the facts on the table. Let everybody confront those facts, facts and let's have a conversation. I'm not suggesting that I have any wisdom that people don't have. I'm simply saying, let us put the facts on the table and let's have a conversation around it. Would it sound good if the government says some of the money that we're saving would be put back to fix our refineries? Those, uh, what I like about that essentially is that's a conversation. Yeah. Okay. And now there are, there are many shades of opinion about that. You know, how well have we done with fixing the existing refineries? Do we really need to be turning those refineries around? How long does it take to bring new refineries on stream? I mean, what has been built by the Dangote Industries is supposed to be a massive intervention in terms of, uh, on the supply side of things, for example. So you can imagine that if you had another one like it, uh, Walter Smith is building a modular refinery in, in, in River State. Uh, we can incentivize that. It would not take, with very focused and concerted effort, it would not take five years to make interventions on the supply side of the equation, rather than attempting to, to, to soften the, the price. It's a, it's a pretty interesting space that we're in, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking that a lot of Nigerians, you know, are looking forward to what comes next, um, trying to adjust to the new normal. Um, there's also fears of inflation and uh, increase in the you know, cost of living, living standards across the country. Um, would, would you have any advice for people at a time like this in adjusting? You ask very excellent questions indeed. You know, and you see, that's a point. The tragedy, and I said this somewhere uh, yesterday, is 
you know, um, fight or flight, which is yeah. a very primitive response to life, essentially. And, and, and I say this with the greatest sense of resp uh, respect, you know, I mean, of, and also of responsibility that we should avoid, you know, zero sum arguments and fight or flight response to, to situations. Because we probably come out, we express anger, and we force a policy position, and we all return. But there is a staying power. This is a marathon rather than a sprint. Okay, and as I ask your question, yeah. is that the true tragedy is if this whole comes, uh, this whole situation comes and goes, and we are just to that new normal. Yeah, life is tougher, but we have not put a process in place. We have not put a system in place to ensure that we are making decisions, investments that would produce a better life tomorrow. I, I'm not sure if you understand what yeah, I'm saying. Of course. Exactly. That's that's the that's the real question. That's the real argument right there. If you ask me, is to say, you know, yes, okay. Uh, what are you really doing? Why is this price? I mean, the why question, the what, the house. You know, why is this price this way? Because um, you did not manufacture this, okay, phone. And so, if you then said to me, Israel, this costs, you know, two hundred fifty thousand naira. Yeah. I bought it at forty-five. I need to make a margin of about five thousand. That's really what it costs. And I said, no, no, no. You have to sell it to me at thirty thousand naira. Okay, that's the sort of conversations we're yeah. having right now. You know, where is the thirty thousand going to come from? Eventually, from you and I, because like I said somewhere else yesterday, that we all pay the price. A trillion naira is Nigerians money belonging to Nigerians. Yeah. It is the, consider the the opportunity cost of the alternative uses of a trillion naira. That is what we should hold every government accountable to for. Okay, and quickly, you know, are there any legal implications to the um, uh, non-inclusion of subsidy in the 2020 uh, budget? Well, what uh, so yes, uh, I mean, uh, as you're aware, the way the executive spends money is in order for any money to be spent, it has to be first appropriated. Yeah. Now, what government used to do was to assume what it would cost to fund under recoveries and then submit it as an appropriation bill and the National Assembly passes it and then it can spend that. Yeah. What it means is that in view of this particular change in policy underpinned by a regulation, there is no provision for funding that system. Can it be brought up tomorrow? Yes, but as at this moment, as far as I'm aware, there is no provision in the budget for funding on the recoveries. That's pretty interesting. Um, Israel, I thank you so much for speaking with us. Is a senior partner at Primera Africa Legal and also director at Aspen Energy. Looking forward to having another conversation with you as, as often as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you.